Hello and welcome to the Dread Expanse. I'm Etch the Quack and I hope you're having a less quack day than myself. This is part 4 of Flames of Dawn. If you have not watched the prior parts of this content, I highly suggest watching the parts prior to this one, or the full version of this content. Links will be provided. To continue from where the last part left off, moving on to the bigger hint, the Order of the Embers and the Inquisitors are basically a makeshift light faction without the overt connection to light magic. I mean, overall, the Order of the Embers managed to create their own holy fire out of alchemy, create their own version of holy weapons out of silver, create its own paladins in the Inquisitors, minus the light, and even create its own doctrine that sounds like a pledge a paladin would take. I mean, listen to this. Brothers and sisters, today you become the searing light that burns away the darkness. Today you become the shining blade that cuts through the wicked. Today you become the beacon of hope against the endless foe. By the authority of House Waycrest, I name you Inquisitors of the Order of Embers. That's a pledge you'd normally associate with every light faction we've seen to date. On top of all of this, they even have a strong connection to the Falcon in the Grey Falcons throughout the area, and the Order's reason for existing, like seemingly always when it comes to these type of Orders in World of Warcraft, comes back to an effective way to combat death. Why is all this important? The Order of Embers solidifies three very important facts surrounding the Light. The first and foremost is, a creature does not need a direct connection to the light or its magic to embody its principles or to achieve the same results as someone wielding light magic. There are seemingly highly diluted sources of light present in nature, it's just you have to be a bit creative to use them. The second thing solidified for the umpteenth time is that the light is highly effective against death, which actually leads onto the last solidification. Silver has a connection to light. Now, if you know your lore, this concept is not new. However, considering its use within the Order of Embers, it is very apparent that its overall connection to light magic is minimal at best. This in turn creates quite a few interesting revelations about Tyr. What do I mean by that? Well, Tyr got his hand bitten off by Galakrond. It was replaced by a literal silver hand forged by Jotun, that watcher that's patrolled the path of the Titans since Wrath. Now, a fun fact I learnt from Locke is, silver, specifically colloidal silver, can act as an antibacterial. So, considering Galakrond was basically an infectious death slash seemingly shadow-ridden monstrosity by the end of its life, the idea Tyr got a silver hand makes sense, as its assumed cleansing powers would have filtered out the necromantic energy suffused into Tyr through the wound. Now, when Tyr died, the place he died was called Tyrusfall, or Tears fall. Now, with such a direct naming scheme, you'd think Tears Hand is where Tears Hand landed after he caused the explosion that mortally wounded the Cthraxi and ended his life. Apparently, that's not the case though. The hand was in the heart of Tears Fall Glade. However, after the battle, it seemingly dropped off the face of the earth, as in apparently no one knows where this hand went. So, the question is what happened to it? Now, considering the sheer reverence the Reichel who moved south had for Tia, I see one of two options happening. The first is, the Reichel melted the hand down and turned it into weapons that would one day become sacred to all the early human tribes. The second and more likely option though, is the Reichel moved the hand to a place where it would never be disturbed and buried it, ensuring no one disturbed the remains of the Keeper they revered. However, considering how big the hand was, I wouldn't be surprised if the Vrykul separated pieces off the hand and hid them in multiple locations explaining why the Vrykul seemingly abandoned Eastwald to the trolls until their human descendants took the area millennia later. They assumedly didn't want any of their ancestors finding the pieces. This would also explain Thoradins, the first king of the humans, need to take a pilgrimage to impress the Tarissi humans, the humans who would eventually become Lordaeronians as they seemingly never forgot about the silver hand and treated the symbol of the hand as a sacred image. However, at the same time, never seemingly had the curative silver on them. Implying Thoradin may have travelled to the present day locations of Tyr's Hand, Stratholm, White Oak Chapel, and Anderhall as a part of this pilgrimage. Stratholm and Tyr's Hand being quite likely locations considering even after the scourging of Lordaeron, Stratholm and Tyr's Hand still produce holy water, implying that purifying effects of the silver may still be active in the area. 
and explaining why the sites became some of the first holy sites for the Church of the Light. Overall, I think a bit of both possibilities may have happened, and what to do with Tyr's hand may have been a compounding reason on top of the Curse of Flesh as to why the Vrykul separated into different tribes after Tyr's death, even though all fundamentally admired the same person and his values. Now, the reason all this is relevant is because at this point, the Vrykul and the humans do not have a connection to the light as we know it today. If anything, you could infer the Teresa humans were similar to the Order of Embers, minus the constant threat of death magic, to our knowledge. And admittedly, the area was under the constant pull of Tyr and Zakaj's essences, which considering everything would imply a pull between the light and shadow. However, even then, if you were to say compare the humans and the Tolvir at this point in history, it would be like comparing apples and oranges. Yes, both are technically fruit, but they are still staggeringly different. All of this implies one of two things, or possibly two things about Tyr. The first implication is Tyr may have been of the light and had a light-based weapon like the Silver Hand, however, because his renowned will was so strong, he never lost himself to the light unlike many others who have used its power. The second possible implication is that the Silver Hand, the actual hand, has greater purifying effects than we originally thought. As in, not only did the effects of the Silver fight off the possible shadow and death magic infection, it also, at least in part, may have expelled the extreme aspects of the Holy Light's magic. Once again, allowing Tyr to retain his person, where others who have been exposed to light for that long begin to lose themselves. This would also imply Silver is a purifier of extreme magic as a whole, not just quote unquote dark slash corruptive magics. Oh yeah, before we move on to the next hint, for those who want a fun fact that will make your jaw drop, courtesy of Locke, IRL Silver just happens to have this one peculiar effect when a person is overexposed to the element. That effect is Argyria, which basically turns a person blue. If you're looking at the image on the screen right now, yeah, I know, that is a massive hint slash explanation slash near perfect, oh, that's what's going on with the Kyrian and Bastion. The only thing I can really add to this is wait till the end. I may have figured out why they're doing it. These circumstances surrounding Tyr and the first humans lead on to the last hint related to the sun on Azeroth. As you already know, the humans eventually did develop deep connections to the Holy Light, and in turn, that connection eventually led to the creation of the first human paladins on Azeroth, and the Order of the Silver Hand. This was facilitated by the Church of the Holy Light, a church that was fundamentally set up by the Naru through influencing the minds of selfless humans after the Troll Wars, like Morelda, the sister of Lord Dane, the person Lordaeron is named after. Now, the question surrounding the Church of the Holy Light and its influence on the humans comes down to a question of why now? Why specifically after the Troll Wars did the Naru suddenly start paying attention to the humans? I mean, for all intents and purposes, it seems as if they could have influenced the humans at any point in time, so why after the Troll Wars? The implication seems to be the sacrifice of Ordain to ensure victory of the Trolls, as his death is directly connected to Morelda's actions of becoming a priest and in turn creating the Church of the Holy Light. And where Lordain's death is a major part of the reason and makes some very interesting connections, there is also another reason I need to mention first. You see, something we've known for a very long time now is Azeroth is seemingly hidden by a protective veil, arguably multiple veils. These veils, for the most part, stop certain creatures getting in and others getting out. Now, considering the difficulty of bypassing these veils, which almost always require Sartmon on Azeroth to open the door, the Naru being the exception to the rule this early in Azeroth's history doesn't make much sense, even if they are just projecting visions. This is where the first hundred human mages come into play. You see, where for the most part fire mages create the fire they use, the first hundred mages didn't actually create the fire that decimated the Armani. They technically summoned it. I mean, if the event being called Fire from the Heavens didn't give it away, what the fire actually does should. The sorceress flames burned lower and troll alike from the inside out. Those flames burned lower, meaning they burned spirits. 
and I'm certain it wasn't normal elemental fire as we're dealing with fire mages. Raising the glaring question, where did that fire come from? Now, I have mentioned in other content the notion that frost and fire mages use fire and water but actually control the power of heat and frost, hot and cold. The idea being the elements that are most easily affected by these principles are fire and water, but fundamentally mages are using a different form of magic than shamans. Taking that notion further, I then asked, why hot and cold? And the only reference that seems to explain why those two specific notions is Seethe and Rukmar. Seethe being the cold-blooded, shadow-related serpent that wished to bask in the sun, Serpents IRL notoriously being cold-blooded animals, while on the other hand, there's Rukmar being the phoenix, which just happens to be universally associated with fire mages and their magic in World of Warcraft, as seen with the Blood Elves and their notorious mages and symbols, to even the Kul Tirans, as demonstrated by the Horde version of the Jade Fire Masters, implying Frost and fire mages that deal with very, very specific aspects of the shadow and the light, specifically the cold of the shadow and the heat of the light. This yes overall does imply I am saying those mages called on the power of something related to the light that is excruciatingly powerful and by doing so they also weaken the veil enough to alert the Naru of Azeroth or at the very least her location and allow them to start influencing the humans. The interesting tidbit that supports this are the dwarves, specifically dwarven paladins. If Dwarven Paladins weren't specifically stated to be a thing, you could easily make the argument they were a player only thing, or after BFA a Dark Iron only thing. Dwarven Paladins are very rare. Turns out though, the Stormpikes might be the clan of Paladins within Ironforge. In Legion, within the Paladin Order Hall, there is a statue of General Lena Stormpike. This is the first reference to Lena in World of Warcraft. What's stunning about the reference, other than the fact that Lena is a Dwarven Paladin, is that she is a Stormpike, as in the Dwarves fighting in Alterac Valley. So firstly, she could have quite possibly been Vandar Stormpike's equal, as she was a general, if not superior, depending on the family relation before her death. Secondly, Lena's existence throws a lot of questions out there about what the Stormpikes have actually been after since they moved into Alterac Valley since we know Dwarves are drawn to Titan Ruins. Couple this with the fact they might be a heavily light-related clan, and the question becomes, is there something relating to the Titans and the Light in Alterac? And if there is, does it have something to do with what the first Super Mages pulled off in Alterac, and the start of the Nara's influence on the humans? This is where Lordain's sacrifice comes into scope, and a fact that I honestly didn't know existed until I was getting feedback on this script. I mean, this fact is blatant and amazing, but geez, I wish I had picked up on this earlier, because adding more to this theory in any way, shape, or form was completely quacked. Anyway, because of my resident Tauran expert, I realized I overlooked what the Yine in Tauran culture actually were. The Yine are basically honored Tauran ancestors that have died saving lives and or creating lives. These are the types of spirit that go to Anshe and help Anshe when he bleeds to signal the dawn is coming. Lordain and his forces died in one of the most selfless ways possible, arguably saving two cultures at once, the High Elves and the humans. Now, where I know Lordain wasn't a Tauran, Here's the connection that I normally would never touch on because I know what reaction it's going to get and because of how unreliable the source generally is. However, when you don't go looking for certain information but find some that lines up this perfectly to such a niche theory, it is incredibly hard to ignore. Hearthstone, Rastakhan's Rumble, Janali, the Firehawk gets added as a legendary card for mages. Battlecry, if you've dealt 8 damage with your hero power, which by default for mages is Fire Blast, summon Ragnaros, the Fire Lord. To explain the connection here, as mentioned, the fire the first 100 mages summoned may not have been their own. If anything, the only thing they did was rip a hole in the veil. The fire probably came from Arnshe, because Lordain and his 500 men proved themselves to be Yine, which probably empowered Arnshe by a ridiculous amount so that when the mages did open the door, 
Anshe let loose the wrath of the sun on the Armani, creatures it probably considered heretical for worshipping Janali, a creature that was probably spawned by or subordinate to Anshe at some point. What's terrifying about this though is those mages may have broken the veil to such an extent that Anshe was able to bring its flames through the Firelands, or worse yet, exert control over the Firelands. And where I know I must sound like I'm selling Ragnaros short, think about it like this. Ragnaros and Alkir were innately corrupted by Nazoth during Cataclysm, and it's generally why they served him without question. Who's to say something else of equal power, if not more power, could do the same to a certain section of the Firelands or any other parts of the Elemental Plane when enough of an opening is provided? Also, if you've done the Dark Iron Dwarf Allied Race questline, you know there is a sect of Dark Irons looking to bring back Ragnaros. And where I know this concept is basically a meme, if the sun does have as much influence as I think it does, in particularly over the element of fire, Ragnaros the Light Lord, Servant of the Sun, is a lot more plausible than you'd expect. I should also state that yes, I am inadvertently saying Anshe might be locked behind a veil in some form of titanic prison similar to the Elemental Plane, which, after the Troll Wars, may have been weakened around Alterac. I am also inadvertently hinting at the notion that Naru, who began showing visions to the humans, may have been locked in the same prison as Anshe. Or if we go with Khadgar's loon theory being plausible, Anshe might have had something to do with the Nara's creation, if not is just extremely similar to them in nature. As in the Yine, help Anshe as he bleeds to signal the dawn. The only thought that comes to mind for me when picturing that is how alternate Velen, being of pure spirit, was able to purify and empower Kahara, the dark star of alternate Draenor, and makes me wonder if Anshe works on a similar premise. This possibility also gives another very good reason for why the Hordes of Valor may have existed in the first place. It may have been the facility that stopped spirits from being drawn and fed to the sun, and why Lordain's death may have seen him become a Yine and result in the Firestorm, as in because Odin hijacked the Hordes of Valor millennia ago, to our knowledge the facility for the most part stopped serving as a buffer for Arnshe. So when Lordain died, his spirit may have been called to and or forcefully taken to the sun, and thinking about it, this also creates some really off questions about that vision Anduin had of Varian on the Broken Shore, and who slash what Anduin actually saw. Thank you for watching.